welcome to Clear Eyes, Full Hearts, a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. This is an episode-by-episode look at the award-winning TV show Friday Night Lights, created by Peter Berg. I am Stacey Orstano. I played Mindy Collette Riggins. And I'm Derek Phillips, and I played Billy Riggins. The assumption is, of course, as always, that you have already watched the show. But if you haven't already, go watch Friday Night Lights, which is currently streaming on Netflix and Peacock TV, because there will be spoilers in our podcast. And check out our merch. That's right, baby. Go check out our brand new website designed by Eleanor Carez, who is at Eleanor Carez on Instagram. Our website is www.cleareyesfullheartspod.com. Once again, that's cleareyesfullheartspod.com. Derek and I love answering your FNL questions, so please email us whatever your burning desire to know is at cleareyesfullheartspod at gmail.com. Today, season one, episode 22, State, baby, we made it, finale of season one. It was written by Jason Cadence and directed by Jeffrey Reiner. Here's our NBC television synopsis. In the season finale, the Panthers gear up for a state championship as rumors swirl about whether or not Coach Taylor will accept a job at TMU. Meanwhile, Tammy receives some surprising news. And today we have a very special guest with us, Taylor Kitsch. So let's get into the highlights of this episode so we can get in there and talk to Taylor. Derek, we've made it. End of season one finale state. The minute Tammy goes into this building, I'm assuming I know what it is. And my first thought was, where's Mama Smash? She better be there. Where's Mama Smash? Yeah, we remember from the second episode that Mama Smash works at Planned Parenthood. So this is kind of a perfect time for Tammy to talk to Mama Smash. And this pregnancy is a giant curveball. But I do love that they included Mama Smash in there to break the news to Tammy. I thought that was a cool little callback to the second episode. Yeah, it was perfect. I got so confused by a number of tickets here. Tyra says she has tickets on the 50-yard line from Tim. Him, and she's going to take Landry. But also I was thinking he probably gave tickets to you. And then there were tickets that he gave to the neighbor. How many tickets does a player get? <laughs> I have no clue. And the neighbor's name is Jackie. I'm sorry. I really do. I know Bo. I... Wait a minute. Are you jealous of Jackie and what I have coming up with her in season two? Wait, what do you have with her in season two? I date Jackie in season two, Stacy. Stop. Is this for real? I actually don't know this. Yes, this is for real. I think you knew that. And I think you're jealous. And that's why you refuse to name her. Yes, her name is Jackie. Call her by her name. Sorry, Jackie. Okay, but I'm glad they sorted it out. I'm assuming he got like maybe four tickets. I have no clue how the tickets work. I mean, maybe Billy got his own tickets. Maybe because Billy's a former Panther player, he got his own tickets. Billy won state as well. So maybe he gets lifetime tickets. Do you have a ring? A state ring? I do have a ring. Yeah, Billy always wore a ring. Look how much I'm learning about Friday mm-hmm. Night Lights just today. <laughs> can't believe you didn't notice my ring. And I can't believe that you don't like Jackie. Oh my God, don't say that. I don't like Jackie. Burt Lincoln's beautiful <laughs> and wonderful. Just so the audience does know, I have had four concussions and sometimes I forget things sometimes, but that's not what this is about. I just haven't watch the show. <laughs> this is also true. Matt, Matt, Matt. He finds out about TMU and coach asks him about it. And he just has this line. He says, I just rather think about football. Very grown up. This is a pretty emotional couple of days here for all these kids on this team. I mean, as we're going to find out, but especially for Matt, because Matt's the one kid in Dylan, besides Julie at this point in time, that knows the coach is leaving for TMU. And he's got to hold on to this secret right in the middle of state. It's a lot to put on a kid. Matt always has a lot on his shoulders. It's ridiculous. Oh, Landry. Oh, yeah. Speaking of poor kids. It was just, <laughs> oh, Jason Kadams is brilliant. He thinks he's just going to take Tyra. They're going to eat chocolates. They're going to drive to Dallas. And then he is stuck in a car with so many women that he did not know were coming. I love that we just had an episode called The Best Laid Plans. The quote is, the best laid plans of mice and men often turn awry. And that once again happens in this episode. One of my favorite lines in this episode is Landry showing up and he goes, hey, Mandy, how's the stripping going? But poor Landry, he's set aside these chocolates for Tyra. He thinks he's going to have this romantic trip. And then Angela hops into the front seat and she's wolfing down the chocolates and talking about being premenstrual. It's it's just (laughs) everything that every seven. 17-year-old or 16-year-old kid wants to hear. I love this whole scene. I love all these scenes with you guys in the car. It was ridiculously fun. Talk to me about it. I want to hear what your experience was like when you were shooting those scenes, Stacey. Well, actually, after Landry says, hey, Mindy, how's the stripping going? I remember my line to him after it because I loved it. And it was fine. How's the awkward teenager thing going? But it got cut like most of my stuff did. (laughs) There's a lot of stuff that gets cut in this show, guys. Just FYI. I mean, so much stuff. Kitch and I used to laugh that everything that we ever did that we thought was 
was amazing, got cut, but there's only so much time in an episode. And we also threw in some stuff that we thought was funny, but probably didn't work for the show. None of the stuff that we did in the car was scripted, except I think for singing Lady Marmalade. Our goal was to make Landry as uncomfortable as possible. So like the stuff about the tampons and grandma putting chocolate all over her face was just us laughing our faces off. It was the most fun day I've ever had on set. It's one of those where I watched it and I go, you know that Luann having chocolate all over her face, that's totally a Luann thing. And I was wondering about the tampon. I was going to ask you if it was uh, scripted or not, but yeah. I just happened to have one in my purse and Dana said it. Everything about that day was so fun. I love his reaction to it too, because the tampon comes flying into the shot and he's just like, oh. Get me out of this car. If he could have jumped out of the car while it was moving, I think he would have. Bless his heart. So we go to Texas Stadium where the Cowboys play. And it is magnanimous and it is awesome. And these kids are in there seeing the stadium for the first time and everything about it feels so big and so grand. And I remember we actually did shoot there. And everybody who was working there that day was like, I can't believe we're here. I can't believe we're in the stadium. And here is what it was like for me. I worked at Texas Stadium all through high school. Every home game I was there, my dad did the play-by-play for the Cowboys. And I did what's called the highlights reel. So I sat in the press box every game. I charted down every play and then I picked the plays that would go on the highlight reel at the end. Like looking back, I didn't know how spoiled I was, but I had an all access pass. I could walk anywhere I wanted to in the stadium, even on the field or into the locker room, which I never did. So when we were there shooting and everyone was freaking out that it was so awesome, I was like, Uh, this feels like work to me. I'm here all the time. (laughs) That's definitely a different experience than what I had because yeah, I mean, I had lived in Texas. At this point, I think I'd been living in Dallas for probably about a year and a half and I was broke all the time. So I never went to any Dallas Cowboy games. But yeah, so that was my first and only time ever being in Texas Stadium because Texas Stadium shortly thereafter was demolished to build a new Texas Stadium, aka Jerry World. It was a pretty cool experience for me. It was such an iconic stadium when I was growing up. The expression on a lot of the kids' faces when they're seeing the stadium for the first time was definitely a very real expression. I felt that same way, although you didn't see my reacting to it. And speaking of, while we're there at the stadium, uh, it's a voodoo! Oh, brother, here we go. I'm so glad that this is the last time we'll have to talk about voodoo on this show. Spoilers. I'll find a way (laughs) to bring it back in. Don't worry. I know you will. How the press knows about the TMU job. I just, I want to know who slipped, but we're never going to find out. Yeah, I don't know either. What's the line? Loose lips, sink ships. It seems to me like it was probably somebody from TMU mentioned something to somebody, probably a Buddy Garrity type, and it wound up uh, leaking to the press. Not Buddy Garrity. I'm saying the TMU probably has their own Buddy Garrity types. Oh God, the Buddy Garrity of TMU. Yeah, I'd love to see who that guy is. Coach's speech about dreams that he gives to the players, I thought it was exceptional. Yeah, it's a beautiful speech. Coach was sick during all this. Everything Mm -hmm. that we shot at Texas Stadium, he was sick as a dog. So, I mean, just the fact that he got any of this stuff out is amazing. Beautiful speech to a very hostile crowd at this point in time. Yeah, they're not super happy. Another just great line from the show to Voodoo. Smash saying, I'm a panther. And I was like, yeah, you are. Look who's turning the tides now. I was on (laughs) Smash's side. I was watching that just thinking in my mind, like hit the bricks, voodoo. But here's something that's really cool. I don't know if our audience knows this, but all the shots of the players in the hotel and Coach and Tammy's hotel room and the balcony shots from their hotel room were all shot in Austin, Texas, actually, at the Hyatt on Barton Springs, which is the Hyatt that all the guest stars stayed in when they would come down to shoot. This is also the hotel where we as a cast watched the pilot for FNL Air on NBC on October 3rd, 2006. Oh, yeah. And this is the same hotel that I mentioned when I was talking to Asha Davis and we had her on the show. And I said that I got so comfortable being in that hotel and I love being there because it meant that I was down there for work, that I actually remodeled my bedroom in Los Angeles to look like the interior of the hotel room because it felt like home to me. That's adorable. So it was just really cool to see that that's the hotel that they used. It's supposed to be Dallas. Just a little behind the scenes stuff there. Derek, why did Tammy telling Eric that she was pregnant make me cry. Is it possible that the concussions have something to do with it? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But no, yeah, I agree. It's a great scene. They say that acting is about listening. And anytime you've got these two on camera, it's really just kind of a, an exercise in listening and reacting. I love when she breaks the news to him. I mean, the expression on his, he plays like five different things in this one scene. 
yeah, which is like disbelief. You're messing with me. And then it's like playful. And then it's the overwhelming joy of we're going to have another kid because they tried for years and years and years and it didn't work. And then now, I mean, it's not the perfect timing, but hey, it's happening and he's excited about it. I can only imagine that that just makes Tammy feel like, oh, well, if he's excited about it, then this is a good thing. In any sports movie, football movies, I live for a halftime speech in the locker room by a coach. And this yeah. one, this one's up there. I'm going to remind you guys again, Kyle at this moment has strep throat and is sick as a dog. Honestly, he was a real trooper making it through those scenes at Cowboy Stadium. We shot all that stuff on the field for the game in one day. And it was a couple of wild days in Dallas, if you remember correctly, Stacey. I, I just remember having a very, very early call time when we shot at Texas Stadium. Oh, yeah. And being exhausted from the festivities the night before. Yep. We got to Dallas and just kind of went wheels off. We went crazy. We knew that our ratings weren't spectacular. This is the final episode of season one. And I think for a lot of us, it was like, we may never see each other again. Anytime that you're on a film shoot or a television shoot and you got a full company move to another location for whatever reason, even if you're working, it feels like it's vacation. Well, because you're all staying at the same hotel too. So it feels yeah. like such a party. I was living in Dallas at the time. And while we were doing this part of the season, I was also doing a musical called Great American Trailer Park, the musical, where I, funnily enough, was also playing a stripper. And production knew that that night that we were shooting our crowd stuff in the stands, that I had a heart out at like six to go to the theater. So we got there probably at like, I think five in the morning was our call yeah. time. We sat around all day in our hair and makeup, didn't get called to the stands. And I was like, I gotta go. So I had my hair and makeup done like by the FNL people to be a stripper there. And then I bolted and ran right to the theater and used that hair and makeup to go be in my show. But that's why Mindy is not in the stands with her family. But I kind of love it because Mindy didn't go to Dallas to go to a football game. She went to party with her friends. It's kind of perfect. And I remember reading a review or something like that years back about episode 22. And it's like, I love this show. They even make Billy look hungover while he's in Dallas. And I'm like, yeah, they didn't really do that so much as I did it to myself. <laughs> this is back in my drinking days. We kind of went a little crazy the night before. Then we wrapped and did it all again the next night. I remember going to Ghost Bar at the W Hotel. And we had a wrap party. Yeah, we had a, basically a wrap party. Mm -hmm. We still had stuff to shoot, if I remember correctly. Like, we weren't completely and totally wrapped yet, but we were basically wrapped in Dallas. And I remember going out to Ghost Bar. Peter Berg was in town, and we mm -hmm. had a lot of people from L.A. in town. Some of our writers, Linda Lowy was in town. Aldous Hodge was in town. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I remember late at night having, like, a wrestling match with Peter Berg outside the W Hotel. Like you do. Yeah, it was, uh, it was nuts. Moving on. I have a lot of moments where I empathize and feel with Smash. I have also dislocated a shoulder and had it popped back in, but mine didn't look anything like Smash's because I screamed my ever-living head off. It hurt really bad. Is it possible that Smash is tougher than you? Absolutely not. I could be, I could beat him at football. You didn't even know how to say it. You stuttered before you said it. Like you wanted to make sure you were getting the word right. I was going to say running, but then I said football. Okay, question. Lila asks Tyra to ride home with her. And I would like to say, in what? You busted your car in Dylan. Where are you riding home in? Maybe she's riding home with Buddy Garrett. I, I highly doubt it. I doubt that. <laughs> which also leaves Landry stuck in a car with me and my mom, which is like a whole other episode I wish we could see. I'd love to see that episode, just you and Landry and your mom. So who knows how Lila and Tyra got back to Dylan, but somehow they did it together. There is no mention of it in season two. Oh, okay. I would like to say you sweeping up Bo and putting him onto the float was so sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was a fun little shoot that we had there. I remember in the previous episode, we were talking about where TMU is located. And TMU, as we said, is located in San Marcos, Texas, about 35 minutes south of Austin. And all the shots from the parade actually take place in San Marcos, Texas. They have a really, really cute, old-timey kind of town square down there in San yeah, Marcos. Yeah, it's very sweet. And that's where we shot all that stuff. I would like to say, here's where the concussion comes in. Do not remember at all shooting that, but there I was standing next to my mom and I was like, I have absolutely no recollection of being there that day. Really? At all. I mean, it was a real quick shoot. All I remember is the night before, they put uh -oh. us up in the crappiest hotel on the planet. Oh no, I remember the scary, scary one. Yeah. Oh, it was the whole thing. Yeah, they were like gunshots outside. Liz Michael has good stories about that. I would just like to say, I found this to be a perfect ending to this season. It's like a tidy bit of a cliffhanger, but also yeah. so satisfying in every way. We didn't know if we were coming back at this point. So our writers kind of wrote, here's some things that may be happening, but just in case, here's things kind of loosely tied up over season one. Mm -hmm. So our writers always did a wonderful job of that because 
for the first two seasons, we had no clue if we were coming back. So that kind of wraps up season one, basically, as far as our highlights are concerned. But I'm excited, Stacey. I don't know if you're excited. We got Taylor Kitsch here. We're about to talk about what his experience on this show was like. So let's stop talking ourselves and go talk to him. Ugh, never heard of him. Hey everybody, I'm here with the one and only Taylor Kitsch, and you all know and love him as Tim Riggins, but he's also one of the hardest working actors in the business, starring in some of the world's biggest films and TV shows, including Lone Survivor, The Bang Bang Club, X-Men Origins, Wolverine, Battleship, Savages, The Normal Heart, John Carter, True Detective, American Assassin, Only the Brave, Waco, 21 Bridges, The Defeated, and The Terminal List, which is coming out later this year on Amazon. So dude, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. I know how busy you are and I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Excited to be here. I think this is where uh, we give uh, a little teaser of that we both, all of us just signed on to a hundred more episodes of Friday Night Lights. <laughs> Guys, you remake. heard it here first. Yeah, you heard it here first. <laughs> We're doing it. None of this is true. We just blew uh, up Hollywood. Yes, Taylor just literally blew up Hollywood. I'm going to jump right in, man. First yeah. and foremost, I know that you're originally from Canada. So my first question is, what was it like growing up in a third world country? <laughs> oh my God. What? Uh, <laughs> we still live in the igloos. Yeah. We're still. Were you um, familiar with indoor plumbing before you arrived in the United States? Still not. Still, still not. not. Yeah, still not. <laughs> no, I gotta, I mean, I don't know how many people know the story, but I mean, my Canadian accent was beaten out of me for this show. I remember coming in late for Riggs, the audition. Everyone had improv with Berg. I was sitting in this boardroom, sitting across from the guy. There's one guy left for Riggs. Mm -hmm. And I came late because of Canada and getting it over the border or lack thereof. And, and I sat in this boardroom and I was just, this is my first test, really. Pete came in. He's like, uh, Taylor Kitsch. And I'm like, yeah. And then he's like, all right, come with me. So we went and improv for 30 minutes. And as, as you guys know, it's everything right on our show. So anyways, we do this improv for 30 and we're walking down the hallway and Pete's like, hey, you're going to be in good shape. We just got to get rid of that Canadian accent. Just do what you did in the room with me and we'll be all right. And I was like, oh, shit. I don't even have an accent. What are you talking about? Yeah, right. I think a lot of people know this, but you were a junior hockey league player in Kelowna, BC, which is just out of Vancouver. And yeah. You, I mean, I don't want to bring up old wounds or whatever, but you were a pretty good hockey player until you got injured. I think you were, what, 20 years old when it happened? Yeah, I was all right. Played junior hockey. And I think playing these athletics, hockey, and these team sports that really, really helped me with rigs. I mean, as you know, all this improv on the field, calling everybody by their number, 2067, and then the nicknames of just all these guys. I mean, that's from hockey. That's just how we talk still. And that just caught on fire when we were doing uh, f and I remember the first time we were out there and I started calling everybody by all these nicknames. No one had a clue what was going on. <laughs> and I was like, it'll catch on, man. Just trust it. Trust it. But yeah, that was a huge part of rig. Dude, I remember one night, this was back in Austin and you had, you had, had a bunch of hockey buddies in town and I made the mistake of going out with you guys one night because <laughs> yeah. uh, those guys were nuts, man. I remember one guy drank candle wax. <gasps> um, and then another oh. dude drank beer out of a woman's shoe. Yeah. And then these guys had to wake up and skate at like six o'clock in the morning. We were out till like four easily. Um, yeah, that was just warm up. Yeah, it didn't play out in my favor. That was one of the things I wanted to talk about, though. I mean, after your hockey injury, it pretty much made a massive change in your life. We wouldn't know you as Taylor Kitsch, the actor, if it hadn't been for that injury. So in some respects, it was a blessing in disguise. A lot of your story, Taylor Kitsch's story, is a story of perseverance in the face of adversity. I know that you and I have talked about this before, but I don't know that a lot of our fans know this. You were actually homeless at one point while you were living in New York City. Would yeah. you mind talking to us about what that experience was like and how- I do mind, D. I do. Uh, no, I'm <laughs> That's all I think <laughs> adversity, that's what shapes you. I'm that stereotypical Canadian guy who just grew up playing hockey, didn't do well in school because I was just like, you know what, I'm going pro. And then that just gets taken from you like in a blink of an eye. So you're kind of just sitting there like just struck. 
of like, what am I going to do now? And I was huge into nutrition and training. I didn't even know, you know, that you could do it for a living acting. I loved it growing up. I took every drama class I could. Loved writing speeches and all that kind of stuff. And then I had an opportunity when I was going to university studying of all things, which was like the worst thing for me possible to study was macroeconomics. That was your you major? Imagine? I started there for like a week. Yeah. And then I was like, you know what? Graphs and numbers are not my thing. Oh my I can God. imagine just like Riggins in the show, I, there were probably some textbooks being thrown out a window at some point in time while oh you're driving down the road. God. Or driving <laughs> down the highway, just throwing them out. Yeah, exactly. But then I was studying kinesiology as well. And then I got an opportunity. And I think if you're going to do something, my personality is all or nothing. So I was like, where do you study acting if you're going to really try and take a swing? And New York and London are probably the best places on the earth to do it. So New York was it. And I went to New York, found a coach named Sheila Gray, who was just incredible with me. I mean, I was a cocky brat. And I kind of one of those I was where I was like, screw process. I can see actors on or movies and this and that. And I'd be like, oh, I can do that. Kind of very very naive, but hungry. And she kicked me out of my first or second class just because I was that guy in class. Pretty naive in the sense of getting to New York. I had a couple thousand dollars saved. You know how fast that goes. Ended up just out of pure stubbornness, staying even though I had zero dollars to my name. There's a really good guy named Mike Sheritz at first that I was living on his girlfriend's blow up mattress And he was subletting a single room in a house. And so I started there. And then obviously that ran its course. And then I moved up to Spanish Harlem. And being Canadian, I had no social security number. So I couldn't get electricity or hot water put on. Oh, God. Yeah, I had this place up in Spanish Harlem that was like, it was no joke. It's kind of quite literally when you turn the lights on, all the bugs scatter and everything. Oh, I lived there too. I lived in Spanish Harlem. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I did too. I was on 158th and Riverside Drive. Yeah, I was 181st in Washington, I think. Yeah. I mean, we're up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. I used to like steal like candles from like yard sales and, you know, those little vendors all over New York. They have peanuts and stuff like that. Steal that. That would be my meal for like a day or two. I remember I had all these candles lit up at night and the neighbor across in the other window called the fire department because they thought my apartment was on fire. (laughs) So in the middle of the night, I have the fire department trying to knock my door down. <laughs> uh, it was just, I'd have like four or five bucks and go buy these big chickens with skin on them and just boil the chicken. And that would be my meal for a while. Doing my own headshots. And then um, I was still studying with Sheila and she was really, really great with me. And that's kind of where the process of figuring out your process started. But I was so green, man. It was just going in there and swinging and quite lawless in that sense. No one knows this story. I broke into the attic of the building and I'm trying to turn my own electricity on and not water and figure this out. And I'm like, yeah, this isn't working. No. Uh, I ended up truly like living on the subway for a bit. I would take the same train, AC or E. And at night it's, you know, it, there's less runs and yep. you could chill on that. And it would stop up there. That was its final stop. And I would sleep under the the seats and then wake up at five. And I still had a gym membership. (laughs) Uh, Of course. Of course. (laughs) Priorities. I was homeless in my car living in LA as well. Mm -hmm. I bought this $1,100 blue Pontiac Firefly. And I went and dug ditches in Barbados. And that was the most time I ever spent with my dad was like, I think like 40 or 50 days. And my uncle... He was running this huge construction site and I was just doing grunt work. If you fly into Barbados, that's me who dug all those ditches for all the oil and gas to go into those huge containers to fuel the planes. So you're welcome. Thank you for your service, Mr. Jeff. Yeah, totally. I'm jumping around, but I remember I had a certified in, in personal training and nutrition and I was training people kind of by your place, D, that gold's there by the yeah, field. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 
in LA and I was doing it for under the table, training these guys and girls and the GM of golds is like, just so you know, you're never allowed in any golds gym. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like, we know what you're doing, man. You're blatantly training people. This is the same golds gym that I remember I called you a few years back. I had booked a gig where my guy had to ride a motorcycle and I never ridden a motorcycle before. And you came out there and you and I rode around. You taught me how to ride a motorcycle yeah. in the parking lot at the Gold's Gym. Yeah. yeah. You can't go inside that Gold's Gym, though. No, Only we in the parking go lot. inside. We weren't allowed, but they... <laughs> you taught me how to ride a motorcycle. And shortly after that, I went and bought a motorcycle. Still didn't know how to ride it. Had another friend take the motorcycle and bring it home. And since then, you and I have gone on some pretty epic rides together. But, yeah, uh, absolutely. Didn't you fall, too, when you... Uh... We don't have to talk about that yeah. one. Oh, we can, we can talk <laughs> about that. Didn't you have to go like 10 feet and get off the bike or something? No. So what happened is I show up to set that day and I walk up and there's a guy literally cleaning this $35,000 Harley with Q-tips. Oh, God. I walk up and I go, is this the motorcycle I'm driving today? And he goes, what? And I go, is this the motorcycle I'm driving? And he goes, you mean riding? And oh, I go, God. oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, do you ride? And I go, eh. And they immediately, <laughs> immediately called in a stunt double. And all the guy had to do literally was just ride into the scene and park the bike. It Jedi. wasn't, I mean, I think I could have done it, but there's a very good chance my second day riding a motorcycle, I'd have laid down a $30,000 Harley. So wow. no, I didn't lay it down, but I did lay my bike down <laughs> Yeah, and ride with you once. You were coming to me. You were on your way to go ride or something. No, Malibu. we were out in the middle of, uh, out in the hills in Austin and I went up a hill and I oh, was in third gear. my God. This is the funniest thing. This is fake. I couldn't... <laughs> I was crying laughing. <laughs> you we were. were and I was at the bottom of a ditch going, can you just stop and help me? Can you just oh help me? Oh my God. Is this when you lost that orange hat too? That's Gospel Hill. That like still upsets me. I know you talked about it for a month and I was like, you are not allowed to talk about this orange hat ever again. <laughs> Taylor had worked on this film called Gospel Hill, and it was like one of your first decent-sized films yep. right outside of a, a FNL. And like your character had worn this orange hat in yep. the film. And I get connected to stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. And you were riding the bike in Austin. I think you had it in like your back pocket or something. No, I'm smartly riding with no helmet, rock star well, mode. Of better. And it flew off your head, and then you went back and could not find the hat yep. anywhere. On Lamar, yeah, in Austin. Yeah. But we had to go back for a second to you putting that mm -hmm. bike. Oh. That was all time. So we're going over these like, remember we had to go through those like really low old school farming road bridges that got flooded. Yes. Real yes. Yeah. And uh, anyways, we're in that backcountry Austin and it goes a hard hairpin and starts going a little right. And you were in third or in a way higher gear than you should have yes. been. And you were given a gas and slowly and awkwardly like go into this like dip. And I was like, I'm just going to sit here. You were okay. I think the, the brake or the shifter and your clutch was messed. My headlight was busted. My yeah. mirror was gone and my, and my brake. And up. your pride was oh. forgotten. My pride was in a bad place because I was laying in the bottom of the ditch trying to get the bike back up. And all I heard was laughing while yes. Taylor was standing at the top of this hill recording it on his phone. <laughs> yeah. and I'm like, come on, man. I mean, for a good five minutes, just sitting yeah. there laughing, laughing yeah. at me. And I'm like, would you just help me? Just help me, please. You had to come down there and help me yeah. get the bike out because I was still not an experienced enough rider to get out of that. If it was just me at that point, I would have died. I'd have been eating food yeah. yeah. at the bottom of that <laughs> ditch until I, until I died. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> for you. Yeah. Not so awesome for me. All right, let's get back on track here real quick. Yeah. So when you auditioned for Friday Night Lights, did you yeah. read the book? Were you familiar with American football? Familiar with American football. I played rugby, obviously hockey, soccer. And then I played one practice of football for the high school and quit. And then I didn't read the book. And I got a call when I was in Vancouver 
after, man, I had done snakes on a plane and then I was auditioning around Vancouver and got a call and they're like, Hey, they want you to just put yourself on tape for Jason street. And so I read the script obviously. And or the pilot, I was like, I kind of feel like I should read for this Tim Riggins guy. They're like, okay, we'll call you back. Call me back. Like, whatever, a few hours later. And they're like, okay, Pete said, go ahead, put yourself on tape for Riggins. I just gravitated towards relatability. He's a lot more troubled. And I always lean into that kind of stuff. And for some reason, I just, I don't know, he just spoke to me a lot more. And then I went and found Texas beer, a Lone Star. I went and found yeah. those big Lone Star beers. You got a tall and, boy. <laughs> a tall boy. Yeah, exactly. And they still have that tape. And God, I was so raw, which I still remember being so green, but raw, man. But you fell on uh, drink beer in your audition tape, right? I was sleeveless, hair flowing. Obviously, you have no idea with any audition where it's going to go. You know, if the show's going to be good, who else involved for the most part? You just want to work. And I really loved the idea of Riggs playing him and and I did the Texas Forever speech and was screwing around drinking beers. And then I got a call that same week. And they're like, you got to fly down tomorrow. You're going to screen test. I'm like, what's a screen test? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it was a zoo getting down there. And I legally got down there, lied, got down to LA, went into the audition, did that improv with Pete. And then Pete was like, there was a reader in the room. And it's all these, it's the most unorganic process, as you guys know, when you're in there, because it's probably like 15 to 20 execs. You haven't met one of them. And Pete's there. And then I sit into this like chair and the reader's like, hey, I'm your reader. I'm like, "Uh, okay. And then Pete kind of pipes up and he's like, you know what? I'm going to read with Kitsch here. I'm like, all right, let's go. And so I start the Texas Forever speech. I knew it inside out, obviously. And so I start it. Pete interrupts me during the speech when he shouldn't have. And he's obviously playing street. Kept interrupting me. And I finally, in character, say, are you going to let me get through this? Or are you just going to sit there and interrupt me this whole time? And he loved that. Yeah. And ripped it. And then I'm not kidding, man. I stayed right across from Universal Studios and I walked into my hotel room and the phone was ringing. And all I got was your Tim Riggins. Dude. And I was like, all right, I want 400,000 an episode. I want this. <laughs> <Absolutely. this back." laughs> no eye contact. On yeah. Sale. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know where Texas was, let alone Austin. Are you serious? I'm not kidding. That's and awesome. then we're all staying in a hotel when we get there. And everyone's just so excited, not really still having an idea of what we're doing. Yeah. And it's Pete, you know, and his element. He hits me up. He's like, hey, you want to come box? And I was like, yeah, let's go box. I've never boxed. And we went up to Richard Lords in Austin, who's an absolute legend. And he just put us through a crazy workout. And I still box to this day. There's so much I've taken from that show that, I mean, it was really set a precedent for the future, man. I think all of us, it was such a springboard that, I mean, all of us wouldn't be where we're at without it. And Pete, as you know, I've worked with Pete five, six times now, and we just wrapped a job called Painkiller that'll be out in the fall, I think, that is probably my proudest work to date. Obviously, we've all evolved as actors, as people. You better. I mean, this is 20 years ago. And so... Obviously, I'm a different actor now and and Pete's a different director and and still has the rawness and the improv. But damn, he was just, I loved working with Pete again on Painkiller. It was just a really very heavy and means an incredible amount to me. D knows a lot about it, just about the opiate crisis that we're in right now and the Sackler family and Oxycontin. I'm not kidding, man. We've done obviously Lone Survivor, Battleship, commercial Call of Duty together and other things, little things. But I mean, Pete's coming out of the editing room. This is the first time ever. I mean, Lone was a a beautiful, beautiful thing that happened to me as well. And he's coming out of the editing room and just calling me and just being like, "Man, we have some." So we're we're excited about it. When Pete Berg says that, you know that it's. I know that's huge. I want to bring it back real quick to yeah, uh, of course, the Friday Night Lights. We talked earlier about the fact that like perseverance in the face of adversity is definitely a Taylor Kitsch trait, but I would also say that it's probably a, a, a Tim Riggins trait. It's definitely a big part of Tim Riggins' story is that idea of perseverance in the face of adversity. So 
what aspects of Tim would you say are similar to you as a person? Mm-hmm. What aspects are completely and totally different? The similarities, I think, for you and I, I mean, we bonded, I think I'll speak for myself, obviously, but just you got two guys that are pretty directionless living together without a father figure. That bond there was everything. My father was in and out of my life. And so I was really rooted into that. That came almost you don't want to say easy, but it was sitting there within you. Acting is all self-exploratory stuff. So, I mean, that really hit home for me. I think with sport for me or anything right now, it's like wildlife photography or something that puts you in the moment and, and really drives the passion and sets you free. For Riggs, it was the field. He had so much stuff going on off the field that when he could play, he could just play and be himself. So that was huge. The big hits and all that kind of stuff, taking the frustration of just life in general out on that. And then these people come around, Billy or Coach, these guys are kind of mentors to him. Not that Billy is really a great mentor. Not so much. (laughs) Not so much. But he is someone that he looked up to, you know, that really kind of just was his father figure in a way as well. Those guys loved each other. I think that's the most oh, man. important thing. As yeah. much as they gave each other crap, they also realized uh, that they were all that they had. You know? Yeah. I mean, I don't think we ever even said on the show, I love you. The characters did. No, I think the closest we came was probably the jail stuff. Yeah. Showing it, you know. It's something that these guys can't say to each other, but we have to know as an audience that that's what keeps them together. Is that? that yeah, love. it's those little like the the grilled cheese moment and the sharing of beer. Like yeah. that's a regular. Oh, yeah. Love you. yeah, yeah, that's one of the those beautiful seminal Friday Night Lights moments. To this day, one of my proudest moments was getting that final moment with you when we were building the yeah. house. It's the final scene that we actually shot on Friday Night Lights. I think it's like the third to final scene in the actual yep. show. But it was the final scene that was shot on Friday Night Lights. And it was this really beautiful moment because we're sitting there in this house that we're building, Tim and I. Metaphorically, but, literally. But Taylor and I as actors are looking out at what we would think would be the sunset. But the reality is it's everybody that ever worked on this show. The entire cast We're sitting there watching crew. this yeah. scene be shot. And it was just kind of this beautiful wrapping up of like a five-year experience that, I mean, I had high school, I had college, and then I had Friday Night Lights. That was a huge moment in my life at that point in time. And I think, too, it was like, it's scary. You're vulnerable. You've gone on this crazy journey that had a life of its own, and you don't know what's next. And it became like family. And it was just all of that was like, you're kind of tipping your hat to it, a cheers. And then you're like, man, what's what's the next chapter going to look like, you know? But yeah, I remember that like yesterday. Yeah, it was a great, great moment. He really wrapped it up. And I think when everybody, and I get it's very flattering that people just, I mean, the following is very, very intense. And I love that. And people want it, you know, a hundred more episodes, but it's like, just go watch that last scene. And it's like, you couldn't end it any better. Don't tell any more of the story. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Taylor had bought a Leica camera and was taking a lot of pictures on set at that point in time. I don't know who you gave the camera to when we were shooting that scene, but somebody got a really great picture. Yeah. You and I sitting in the house as it's being built, cheersing. Mm-hmm. And it's a great black and white photo of the two of us that you had signed to me. Something I can't even remember what it says. It's up in my living room. Thanks you know? for nothing. <laughs> yeah, I think probably. something like that, probably. <laughs> like, I still laugh about you being in that ditch, Taylor <laughs> Kitch. How did you get casted in this? Uh, ditch forever yeah, too. that's yeah. probably exactly yeah. what it says i never read it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah totally oh man but i yeah. do have that signed picture from you the great picture of the two of us a lot of wonderful memories from this show man i mean obviously you take as much as you can and you instill it in moving forward and you our process as i'm sure everyone on this podcast has talked about was just so free no marks no rehearsal no lighting setups for the most part yeah. You know, 99% of the time, it's like, whoa, if we saw a light being moved, we're like, this is, let's move, guys. We got to keep this moving. This is a joke. Yeah. yeah. You know? And so you pick up all these moments and, and tools, obviously. The camera was from Bang Bang. So I love photography. That's a huge part of my life now. Yeah. And then going into all these other jobs, I went from FNL and in between seasons, I went and did X-Men. And I was like, this is all on stage. They're building sets. I'd never really seen any of this. Yeah. And so that's a whole different type of acting. That was a huge crash course for me. 
yeah. of just like, what is happening? And it's like, even to this day, you know, just shooting with Pete or going to terminal list is a good example of just like, it's pretty darn technical, mm-hmm. not with Pete on painkiller, but terminal list was very like, it's a beautifully shot in a different way than F and L, but it's technical. And you know, when your close-ups coming and for F and L, it was like our close-up starts on take one. Yeah. yeah you don't even you know? know we're doing swingles and they're moving around dancing with you. And you're just like, man, this is awesome. Yeah. And then it's like on terminal list or defeated or something, which has its own different payoff, but it's like, we're going to start with a crane and then we're going to set up tracks. That's going to take an hour. And then we're going to do this shot and this, and it's like, okay, so take 18. We're going to actually get the real stuff. Yeah. You know, so I miss that rawness yeah, of what we too. had because it's like, one, you better bring your A game right away. There's no mm-hmm. real warm up. We're in it. And that leads to all these magical moments through our improv. It's very, very natural because you're on a close up and me, dear, anyone for that matter is throwing this improv and you're just reacting. There's a moment where you say they're doing the roast. Do you remember that scene where they're roasting all the like all oh, the players? Oh yeah, the wedding. Each other? No, it's not at the wedding because you. This is in the first season. You say, "Hey, how about Matt Saracen sleeping with the coach's, the coach's daughter? daughter?" And then crickets. Do you not remember this? I improv that, yeah. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Okay, so Riggins is like brooding and moody, but as the episodes go on, we start to see this other side that we know of you as Taylor Kitchen, that you're hysterically funny, but I feel like the writers finally started to give you some Mm. of that too. Now he's this actually rounded person that has sides and levels. Was that something that you like asked for or did it just happen organically? Because we just watch you be Taylor. I think it was a mix of both, to be (laughs) honest. The deeper we get into these, seasons, the more you want to show as well. You can only watch someone brood or emote so much before you just get numbed out as well. You got to earn your beats and having the improv ability and the freedom. It was like, you know what? They can cut it out if they don't like it. And so I was just like, going up to that podium and trying to just get some great reactions. I will <laughs> never such a forget. great moment, dude. It's, great. I forgot it, about it. That's the wonderful thing about going back through and doing yeah. a watch of these shows. I haven't watched it in 10, 12 years. We have to talk about the hunting scene when oh, I come. I don't know if you remember it as yeah. clearly as I do. Stacey was in but, that one as oh, well. Oh, yeah, us yeah. three. I remember you guys were sitting on the table by the window and I come in with a shotgun. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, they call it flagging when you bring the <laughs> barrel of a gun across somebody's body. So I'm flagging you guys this whole time. And the camera's on you guys. And I don't even know. I'm like, screw the lines. I'm going in and I'm going to roast you, D. Yes. And I guilt tripped you so, made you look like the worst <laughs> brother on the planet. And then Stace was like, so in on it with me. I come in and you're like, careful with the shotgun. I'm like, relax. I don't even think it's loaded. (laughs) That's what it was. You like have to like ground the scene and actually do what's written. You're like, hey, man, I don't think I can go on this hunting trip. And I go off. Yes. I make up this trip as if we've been doing it our <laughs> That's whole right. I life. I forgot about this. That's right. <laughs> every that. year. Every year, Billy. You're going to yeah. give it every year. I'm like, what? Tradition. Yes, it's a tradition. <laughs> this is tell. all we got. This is all we got. <laughs> and then Mindy pipes up and she's just like, yeah, you should, I don't know, maybe rethink it. And you're like, what is happening <laughs> right now? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> there were a lot of moments like that on this show, though, where it was like, dude, I, I still have to be the one that has to say this at the end of the scene. I know. And yeah, we're going to make it me. as hard as possible for you yeah. to do your yeah. job. <laughs> killing me. The, what uh, about when our dad comes back and you're shirtless at breakfast? Yes. Oh, dude, you got to tell this story. This scene got cut. Right? We've talked it about did? this on the show. Yeah, the scene got cut uh, from the actual why? show. Did it really? Okay. Yeah, but so I walk into the scene with my shirt off. <laughs> And Taylor just starts in like, oh, my God. I can't eat my breakfast. It's so gross. And I'm like, what? What? And he's like, dude, put a shirt on. (laughs) On camera, just 
roasting him. Non-stop. He had I mean, fasted for three weeks. Oh my god, those moments, man. Yeah, oh. I, th- there was a lot of that on the show, though, with us just—I mean, crying, laughing, my sides hurting. But Stacy and I were talking about this earlier as well. That like we were saying who we thought the funniest person on the show was, and I'm like, it's definitely Taylor. But I come to find out because I actually did a little research for this interview, Taylor. You Uh-oh. were. <laughs> you were voted the funniest kid in your high school. Is that true? Yeah, I was definitely anything for a laugh in high yeah. school. Like I had no problem getting kicked out of class just for a good laugh. Yeah, I was a class clown. I did some crazy stuff, man. I mean, I remember in photography class, like leaving class, buying a car for a case of beer, getting it insured. It had no brakes. And by <laughs> end of photography class, we're rolling up in this brown Corolla and we couldn't stop. So we would e-brake and use the curb as a stop. Like that's the kind of stuff I did in high school. I look back on all this time and just the times, what was the car that you had the first season of the show, that beat up piece of crap? Oh, I had a, was it a Ford so Focus? I grew up with not, I'm like mobile home, like not a lot of money. And you're starting to make more money than you have money to get a car. And I'm like, oh, okay, I had no manager, business manager, anybody to help me. So I rented a car the yeah. whole season, man. <laughs> it was a gold Toyota something car. And I beat that thing to hell and back. But I would just be ripping in that the yes. whole season. E-brakes going up. Yeah, oh my God. Around every corner. <laughs> but I remember like the Riggins house had its own tone. Every time you're rolling up to this house, you had to know that you have to expect the unexpected. I had no <laughs> idea what was going on. And like, it was disgusting, this yes. house. Yes. I remember we called a day because they had to get all the bugs and fleas off the couch. And oh, like, yeah. it was honestly disgusting. Oh, At the God. end of the first season or maybe second season, they literally took the couch out and drug it across the track around the football field, destroyed the couch because it was like, we're getting rid of this couch. Oh. The Burn couch it. was covered. Yeah. And they yeah. dragged it behind a pickup truck and like, <laughs> thing broke apart a million pieces. There was just an energy in the Riggins house. We were just, no pun intended, but truly at home and the freedom there was I was more free in that house it was truly that domain man and the crew loved it there was a lot of riggins that carried over into real life we went to some fancy restaurant one time it's a, a, like an oh. Asian fusion place I want to say it was on like South Congress and you and I went in there and I was wearing like a white button down linen shirt I remember this specifically <laughs> because I was eating a dumpling and the dumpling fell and landed in the soy sauce and the soy sauce <laughs> splashed up and landed all over my shirt so the front of my my shirt was now covered with soy sauce. And so you and I are sitting there in this restaurant. I'm covered in soy sauce. And as trying we're walking to act out, classy. Yeah, yeah, trying to be classy. And it's like <laughs> just not happening. And as we're walking out, you rip the biggest fart. And this person <laughs> looks over at us at the table next to us and you go, what? Riggins brothers. And just kept walking. <laughs> oh God. It's the best. Yeah. Oh my God. The best, man. Oh, I also wanted to say real quick about the car. I remember we would go valet the car and it was the biggest piece of crap, this car. Yeah. Hitch would like throw the keys <laughs> to the valet and be like, hey, fuck it in a nice place. <laughs> <laughs> Like we're pulling into places that have like Lamborghinis and kitchens. Like, yeah. make sure you put it in a nice spot. Take care of her. <laughs> it hasn't been washed for a year and a half. Exactly. <laughs> oh my oh, god. Man. Okay, Taylor, maybe come back on with us another. Cause there's so many more stories we there's need to tell. There's so many. We're, we're like just actually find started. out about your process <laughs> some other time. <laughs> I know, man. There's about 20 questions I didn't get to, but that's no. all good. Doesn't matter. Um, this was better. We knew this was going to happen, by the yeah. way. We completely it's did. <laughs> this is exactly what we wanted. So, dude, yeah. thank you again so much for coming on here, man. I know how busy of course. you are. I know how crazy your schedule is these days. I think we already talked about what you're working on now. We just talked about Painkiller, which is going to be coming out. And we also talked about Terminalist, which I have a huge part of. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. massive. <laughs> Derek Phillips, Chris Pratt. <laughs> uh-huh. A Derek Phillips joint. 
Yeah, it's a Derek Phillips joint. I think I have like five <laughs> lines in the whole show. Thanks to Taylor. Though. I, Thank you. I for that. sent you uh, that teaser too. It's yeah. it's going to be good, man. It really I'm, is. I'm pumped. I just saw the teaser the other day. I'm excited for all you guys to see the teaser. Taylor's great in it. It's going to be a really amazing show. And I think it's going to have a pretty big following. So yeah, I'm excited for it. And I'm excited for you. Anyway, man, right. thank you so much for coming on the show. Taylor, we love you. Come back and play with us. Love you guys too. Thanks for having me. We'll do it again. You guys, we made it. That is all of season one, episode 22. Thank you guys so much for joining us for this whole entire season. Stick around because next week we're jumping right into it. Season two, episode one, titled Last Days of Summer. But until then, clear eyes. Full hearts. You know the rest. Clear Eyes, Full Hearts is a podcast presentation of Cadence 13 in association with Black Barrel Media and Ritual Productions. Executive producers are Stacey Oristano and Derek Phillips, Chris and Mandy Wimmer for Black Barrel Media, and Steve Walters for Ritual Productions. Our producer is Miranda Parham. Send your questions to clearEyesFullHeartsPod at gmail.com. Find us on social media. I'm Stacey Oristano on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm at Derek Phillips on Twitter and underscore Derek Phillips on Instagram. And check out our websites, clearEyesFullHeartsPod.com, Cadence13.com, and BlackBarrelMedia.com. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll see you next week.